to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to another episode of A Well-Designed Business. It's Power Talk Friday. On the show today, I have two very interesting women who have been in the design industry for decades. They are Susan Whalen, the president of Pollock, and Rachel Doris, the design director at Pollock. Today, we talk about the types of opportunities that are open to you in the industry other than being an interior designer. We also talk about their leadership at Pollock and how they work consciously to create a company culture that encourages creativity, loyalty, and longevity in the entire team at Pollock, from the president to the memo concierge to the warehouse personnel. It's another great conversation, which builds on our recent shows with Eileen Hahn, number 353, and Janelle Fotopoulos, number 364, where we've been talking about how do you create and how do you lead an exceptional interior design business? So these are great companion shows to this one. Now, a little about these ladies. Susan Whalen's career at Pollock began as the studio manager, where she worked with founding design director Mark Pollock. In this position, she learned all aspects of design and product development. In 2004, she shifted to the business side and took on additional responsibilities that led to her appointments as vice president and chief operating officer in 2008. As president, Susan is responsible for all operations, design, Design, sales and marketing for both Pollock and the Weitzner brands. While Rick Sullivan remains in his position as CEO, acting as an ongoing advisor to Susan and her team. Rachel Doris, in addition to her duties at Pollock, tours the country, offering a continuing education course called Textiles 102, Inspiration, Imagination, and Interpretation, which challenges designers to examine how material, construction, pattern, and color are resolved to create a physically functional and aesthetically pleasing fabric. She has been featured in Apartment Therapy and various Hearst Shelter mag- publications. Her designs have earned awards, and two of her creations, Mod and Curly Q, are in the permanent collection of the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum. I think you're going to enjoy this conversation. Of course, I always say that. I know that. (laughs) Anyway, here we are with my conversation with Susan and Rachel. Hi, Susan. Hi, Rachel. Thanks so much for joining me on A Well-Designed Business today. Hi, Luann. This is Susan. It's great to be here with you. This is Rachel. I'm happy to be here as well. Yes. So before we do one thing, just the the very first thing I have to do is I have to give a shout out to Ruthie Reiner, who is my sales rep for Pollock. And um, I just want to say, hey, Ruthie, how are you, lady? (laughs) And I want to let you two women know that she is an outstanding sales rep. So uh, she's been in my rep for many, many years, and she's always on her game. So I just want to compliment all of you on that. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. This is Susan. Ruthie's been with us a long time and she's one of the best out there and we love her energy (laughs) and she's always just a pleasure to be around and she's a great salesperson. Absolutely. I 100% agree. So, okay. So here's the thing. We're going to talk with you guys about your, this company here. And there's a few things in here that I'd love to get to and pick apart with you. Um, One of the things is that I have, you know, I, I coach interior designers. And one of the things is sometimes somebody has spent their, you know, four years in college, whatever their road is to interior design, only to get there and be doing interior design and finding out like, you know, I don't love this so much. <laughs> like, like, I love the industry. I love 
the things in the industry. I love the beauty of the industry. They might even like the business side of the industry. But sometimes that consumer facing model is um, not for everybody, right? It's just not, not for everybody. And I just think that a lot of times, and I've mentioned it to uh, designers that I've coached, you know, look to the industry partners like Pollock and think about a career within a company like this so that you're involved and you're still getting all that juice and that joy of the beauty and all of that. So talk to us a little bit about the opportunities and the types of things that you two notice within your positions and your company that you feel are great alternatives for a designer, a creative listening to understand what it would be like. Um, sure, I can start with that, Luanne. This is Susan. I think a lot of people out there don't even really understand that there is this whole industry of textiles and that there's large companies that are doing what we do. And, you know, we're a mid-sized company. We have about 70 employees. And if you're not going to be going straight into the interior design world, but you still want to be part of this design process and in, in, for interiors, then there are a lot of opportunities. I think a, a natural a natural option might be to go into sales, like we just talked about Ruthie. Uh, she's been showing fabrics and wall coverings to to interior designers for many, many years, and she found her kind of place there, and she still gets to be around it all, but she's not facing front with the with the actual end user who's redecorating their living room. Mm. So I think sales is a, is a natural opportunity for in this industry. There's also other things like marketing. Um, we have people on staff that handle our social media, and that's still a very creative outlet. Um, and other support functions for our sales team, such as uh, we have a materials concierge on staff, and her job is to support with with help scheming and finding substitutes if something's out of stock, and just doing that creative back that work in the in the back office that helps the frontline sales get the job. Right. And the thing about it is, it's funny because, you know, a lot of people shy away from the word sales and they think of it as like, oh, I don't like to be, I'm not a salesperson, blah, blah, blah. But the thing about this is, first of all, I always tell interior designer, if you own a business, you're a salesman, like right there. You have to sell yourself yep. every day, no matter what label you put on it, go ahead. But at the end of the day, you're a salesperson. But sales for uh, for a company like Pollock is different. That's This is relationship sales. So you have to, the first time you meet an account, you have to make that impression and make that sale. But after that, it's relationship building, which is a whole different sales mm -hmm. than you know, initial every single time trying to make an impression, make a sale, make an impression, make a sale. And it's, it's, it's um, for people who, for lack of a better way to describe it, don't consider themselves type A salespeople. Relationship sales, working as um, a salesperson for a vendor situation is very different than a type A salesperson skill set. And a lot of designers may be suited to it for that reason. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And so much of it comes down, this is Susan, comes down to helping to manage projects that are going on, having, being really a resource for the, for the designer, not just coming and showing pretty fabric and then walking out the door. It's, yeah. you really need to be engaged with them, knowing what they're working on, understanding what they, what their jobs require, being a resource and being, you know, having great support and customer service and all of those other things that go into that relationship. Yeah, I, what I like about it is I, you know, have had many, many sales reps over the years at Window Works from all the different fabric companies. And you can tell the sales reps that do understand what we do better than the ones that don't because mm -hmm. they do get that, you know, it can be a fabric emergency. <laughs> <laughs> There is such a thing as a fabric emergency. <laughs> I mean, you it's know, so like funny. it sounds ridiculous, but it's true. And we all know it. I had a designer call me last week and she said she left a message at the showroom for me. I wasn't in and it said XYZ designer. This is an emergency. Please call right away. And I like just had a laugh. Right. You know what I mean? Because the two sides of my brain is like. So when I called, I actually said, hey, it's Luann, you know, yada, yada. I said, actually, should I be saying? it's Dr. Luann or I mean are, are <laughs> right. we is this a life or death like do I need to get my oh like my gloves gosh. on <laughs> and she like started laughing I'm like okay really what is the emergency you know <laughs> but I, I have had fabric emergencies and you do appreciate 
of a rep that does not um, minimize the reality of what you're going on. We all have to get real at some point right. and understand we are not saving lives. But until that point, you really do appreciate a company that really sort of gets involved with you and, right. and understands. And so, um, so I, I always suggest that for somebody who doesn't feel like as an, an interior designer principal that they have the chops to be the salesperson, that this is a way to be in the industry. And so, okay, and the other part about um, Pollock is that's really interesting is that you have a great uh, corporate culture over there. Oh, well, you know what, before we talk about that, I wanted to just ask you something, Rachel. Your yes. design director, I, the, the designers that work for you, we know as of industry for interior design, we can list iconic interior designers all the way to the regular designer that lives in our neighborhood that are absolutely talented without a formal interior design education, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm thinking of David Phoenix is one. There's many, many, many iconic ones, let alone, like I said, our, our regular peers. Isn't that crazy? Our regular peers, regular people right. like <laughs> us, right? Um, but is that possible to be a textile designer and learn it through the School of Hard Knocks? Or do you always, when you are hiring studio designers to work with you, um, designing fabrics and so forth, do they need to have a formal education? That's a great question. Um, I think a lot of people think that textile design is all about pattern and it's so easy to put together um, a pretty pattern. But at Pollock, we pride ourselves on the whole fabric. So down to the minute details of the yarn, the construction, um, what mills we're using, and the pattern is part of it, but it's not the whole thing. So we really set ourselves aside being um, architects of the fabric. So in this case, the way that we work, uh, a formal education or a lot of experience to understand how the fabric is made is essential. Mm. And I think that that also starts with a love of textiles, wherever that kind of um, comes comes from, whether you've always been interested as a child or you mm -hmm. learned about it um, in your experience in life. But I don't think it's the type of career where <laughs> you're trying to choose what you want to do. Like, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a fireman. I want to be a textile designer. It doesn't come <laughs> from uh, such an obvious place. I think it kind of percolates and um, depending on how you are um, introduced to it, uh, it can bloom into a career, but um, some technical knowledge is essential. That being said, there are um, many kind of rock star designers who do a fabric collection, um, put their name on it, but behind the scenes, there are um, textile designers working with them and helping to uh, create um, a functional, beautiful fabric. Um, in what we do, there are a lot of limitations because we're working with machinery that has um, specific sizes and yarns and color uh, possibilities. So you really need someone um, understanding that side of things. Um, so if, so if a designer wants to switch over into the textile world, I recommend taking some classes and really uh, starting to understand um, what makes what goes into a woven or printed fabric. Okay. Okay. So, and, and it's funny, one thing you said in there was you don't necessarily, you know, grow up saying, I'm going to do this. It's sort of sometimes often you're saying happens that way. I remember we, I interviewed Melanie B. Do you guys know Melanie B? She's a surface and uh, designer here in the New York City area. She has a line. Yeah, I've of, heard of her. Right? Yeah. Oh my God. A fierce lady. A lover. Lover, lover, lover. Um, but she has a carpet line. She has a wallpaper mm -hmm. line. She has a tile line. And in her interview, she expressed how she was at interior design school. And then whatever the exact conversation was that she mentioned, how she took a, a, a surface class surface design mm -hmm. class and she was like oh i didn't this know this is... <laughs> existed <laughs> right right and it's just they so you're that's what you're saying too Some yeah. something will happen and you'll just be like oh okay this really speaks to me i certainly didn't know there was a job in it um it started just from a love of fabric and um certain things happened in my life and certain opportunities that got me to where i am and um but it all comes down to love of textiles mm -hmm. and we even talk about that we work with over 100 mills worldwide so I have relationships with a lot of people around the world and 
we're always joking. You don't go into this industry for the money. <laughs> you go into it for for the love of what you do. So we work with a lot of mills in Italy, and in that culture, um, the people have grown up understanding textiles. I think a little bit more than in the U.S. So a real um, understanding and respect for quality. So different wools, and you think about um, beautiful uh, men's wool suiting coming out of Italy. So they've they've seen this throughout their lives and um, have a love of it. That's kind of, um, you know, the seed was planted at a young age. Right. It's like in their DNA is what you're exactly. saying. And you're just yeah. like, I have to do this. I have to be involved yes. in this. Yes. And I love the fabric. And don't you love it? And yes. I think that... Um, <laughs> You know, just to add on to what Susan was saying about a good sales rep, um, if they're coming from interior design, obviously they they love what they're doing. They love surfaces and um, colors and scheming. I think that having that um, internal kind of drive makes the best salesperson. Again, it's, you don't just choose, I'm going to sell fabric. It's not an easy thing to do. Right. You know, um, all of our reps are really um, into the design and love our collections personally and put their put the fabric in their homes as well. So, um, again, this isn't this isn't banking. This is a very specific <laughs> uh, kind of boutique thing that we do. Exactly. So there's one thing also in there that you mentioned, Rachel, how you partner and you have these relationships with interior designers that have textile lines. And of course, now is the time that we have to talk about Lori Weitzner, right? She is actually, this is a formal business partnership with Pollock and Weitzner. This isn't just a licensed line or anything like that. You are physically, financially partners with Lori, correct? That's correct. Right. And so one of the things that I remember when Lori was on the show, she was actually episode number 308, as a matter of fact. And one of my top favorite interviews was with Lori. She was so real about her journey and about the, um, you know, the right turns and the wrong turns. That's the way I want to say it. She really was sharing the thing. You, you look at somebody at that level, at that iconic level and the success that she has, and you just think they just poof, show up that way. But she really pulled back the curtain and explained the, you know, the tough decisions that she had, the moments that made her break, made her broke a, a, a career move decision one way or another. So it was very, very awesome. If you guys missed it, you need to listen to that episode, everybody. But it was the, a great episode. Yeah, right? Um, but the thing about it is, is that is different. Lori is a textile designer. That is what she has been since she is a young woman. This, it's, it's like you, Rachel. She is a textile designer. But then when you mention celebrity designers or just designers that do a, a collection with you, that's different. So you have a, a collaboration now with uh, Gary Graham right? Correct. Yeah. So, so I have interviewed a, a few people that have licensed collections. So like Barclay Batera and Candace Olson and David Phoenix, these are all uh, designers that have licensed collections with Kravit. So that tell us a little bit about that for you guys, when you mentioned that a designer, if they're out there and they're thinking about and would have had this dream to do a collection of fabric, how does that work with Pollock? Well, we've only done um, a handful of collaborations. Uh, we did a collaboration with Coral and Tusk. Um, they do beautiful embroideries and pillows and product. Um, then we've done um, collaborations with like a designer, an artist that we did one fabric, and then a London design team called a Rum Fellow. So those are the four where we've worked with actual live people rather than a museum. Um, when we go about it, it's actually looking for something that the Pollock studio can't bring to the table or has a different hand or different artistic kind of uh, feel and vision. Um, we, we don't look for the name mm. uh, at all. Mm -hmm. So for us working with Gary Graham, we, he's a, just if people don't know who he is, he's a New York based fashion designer um, who is really well known for his um, kind of moody, elegant, goth in a way, decorative, uh, beautiful clothing. And we've been fans of his for 
like 20 years. So I know Gary through uh, the fashion industry and I've worn his clothing a lot. And at one point we were having lunch and I said, you know what, it's about time we do something together. And, and in a lot of his fashions, he creates these um, whole spaces to kind of uh, give you the feel of um, uh, the vibe of that collection. Mm. And so he was really excited because it was one more step of creating the whole space. And when we talked about working together, I really wanted to give him um, a lot of leeway to come up with um, kind of the theme for the collection. Do you want me to keep going here and talk about how that collection evolved? Yes, or do you I want think it? it's, yeah, definitely share it with us. Okay, so when we started talking, I didn't want to just do, oh, yeah, here's some patterns by Gary Graham. There needed to be um, a source of inspiration because that's really when your best work comes out, where you take one little thing that is your inspiration and you kind of blow that out and expand on it. And we talked about it being a place, so starting with a place. So Gary worked with the Historical Society in Rhode Island and got access to three location. One was... Um, a colonial fortress in Newport Harbor. One was um, a Victorian museum and then a lighthouse that was on Block Island. So he went in there with a photographer and a videographer and took all these photographs of the spaces, of the walls, of kind of deteriorating textiles. They're very moody, these um, old kind of New England spaces and haunted in a way. Mm. So he came back with all of these beautiful images. We looked together and I edited out, um, I edited together a collection that I thought could be appropriate for interiors. And together we started developing patterns and talking about qualities. When I say qualities, that means the woven fabric and what type of construction and what surface. And it just kind of bloomed and evolved from there. But I think most important, it's about having an inspiration rather than just like, hey, this is my name. I'm going to do something cool. <laughs> I like pattern. You know, like why, why are you actually doing something? Right. So the, our why was to really um, bring kind of a decorative, haunted, um, a little bit um, like candlelit type feeling interior fabrics to our line, which was something that uh, we're not necessarily doing in the Pollock studio. So it's this beautiful little kind of capsule collection within our collection. Very cool. That's that's very, you know, the, the little journey there and, and of how the inspiration came and the way you do it. So ultimately it sounds like he's not necessarily so much designing the actual textiles but he's inspiring you and your team and then like you said you edited and you you came up with the things that would fit the mood of what he was going for yeah he created some of the patterns and then we worked together to create some of the patterns Interesting. for yeah for example there was um the um one of the homes in the fortress and it was so beat you know, the walls are peeling, there's limestone and um, like plastered walls that are mm. peeling. And it was actually beautiful and the light was coming in and hitting it. So one of the designers in my studio, she took a big piece of paper and she did this kind of natural watercolor effect in um, kind of browns and grays, very watery. And then on top, she painted really thick white pigment paint. And then when a on it and scraped it and sanded it down so it looked like wear on these walls then Whoa. from there she took that piece of artwork scanned it into the computer put it into repeat repeat is when you have the repeating unit in your pattern right. and and we made it in the correct scale reduced the colors so that it would work with the weave construction emailed that to the mill specified yarns and then had a woven sample so that's kind of the quick version of how we develop a fabric but it, so in that case we did de we designed the pattern right. but then there's a more decorative fabric called cloister that was inspired by um a beautiful wall inlay in the victorian mansion and gary really put together this kind of um broken floral that's quite beautiful and and d different than the hand coming out of my design studio 
That's it's it's remarkable. I mean, it's just you know you we, we it's just like anything else. It's funny because I always tell interior designers, your clients don't realize what goes into your project into the process the 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 behind the scenes of every detail that you do and when you don't share that that's when they don't recognize your value and that's when they Mm -hmm. are more likely to push back you uh, to you on whatever you're charging whether it is on a piece or it's your hourly rate or whatever and it's the same thing we all look at these fabrics and we're (laughs) like that must be hard to do okay well whatever let me have five yards of it it's really funny um (laughs) One of the one of my designers who uh, had just started, she went out on some sales calls, and we asked her after she was with a salesperson and she was presenting the collection, and, and we said, "Well, what did you think?" And she couldn't believe it that each fabric has about two seconds <laughs> in the designer's hand, and then they move on to something else. So something mm-hmm. that she may have slaved away on for yes. a year, yes. these fabrics take so long to develop, gets like two. Maybe five. I'm exaggerating. Five <laughs> yeah, seconds, yeah. and then they move on. And it's right. like, oh, my baby, there it goes. I know, I know. Yeah. We have but the reps really come fun. in and show us the new line, and we're just like, yes, yes, no, no, yes, yes, yeah, no, yeah. no, yes, no, yes, no. Okay, right. see you, bye. <laughs> and then there's another level. So there's, you know, your your client, and then there's you as the interior designer. There's me as the textile designer. Then there's the mill designers. Yeah. So they have a whole team at the mill um, that are coming up with uh, different yarns and construction instructions and um, making it viable and then there's the yarn spinners and the dyers before them so there's this whole chain of love and <laughs> pain <laughs> that comes behind these beautiful fabrics that get five seconds I know <laughs> I know I know it's crazy it's crazy so so one of the things that I wanted to talk about was how what I recall Lori really liking about the opportunity to partner with you guys is because she is a textile designer and she wants to do that she doesn't want to run the business side of it, right? She didn't, she, she actually expressed that sentiment that this was um, a, a, a perfect marriage for her in the sense that she knew now that that whole side of it would be taken care of well. And right. so tell us a little bit about the Pollock culture, because I also know she also did describe that it was a great fit and a great home for her. And we have had um, some shows recently where interior designers are, we've been talking to interior designers who are successful at developing a positive team environment, an uplifting environment. Uh, Janelle Fotopoulos from Blakely Interior Design, Rhode Island, as a matter of fact, um, she very intentionally in the last year has looked at each team member, had them assessed objectively, but then also personally, uh, just figuring out where their zone of genius is, where are they the most productive, the most happy. And she has described to us how in playing chess with her team and putting people in the places that they're the happiest, that it has uplifted her entire company. Their productivity has gone up, their efficiency has gone up. And then we had a Power Talk Friday with Eileen Hahn, who is a consultant that specializes in coaching businesses to do this. So, but you guys are known for this particular terrific culture as well. Does one of you want to talk to that about how do you, as leaders of your company, and you know Susan is leader of the company, and and um, Rachel is leader of your department. How you go about intentionally doing this? Tips for us as business owners. Sure, I'd love to start, um, and I'm sure Rachel will have some things to say as well. Um, both of us have been with the company for almost 20 years, so mm. we have grown up in the company. We have moved moved up in the company, so to speak. Uh, Rachel in the design studio, and I actually started in the design studio, and then. Um, had the opportunity to move over to work under the president and CEO on the business side, which was what my goal was. So just the fact that I was afforded the opportunity to have uh, another position and role in the company and be able to move up in the company speaks to just the the culture in general that we're looking to promote from within mm. we 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 really value and appreciate all of the employees that work here whether they work in the sample department making memo samples or whether they're cutting fabric to ship an order out 
answering calls in the customer service department, you know, the sales side, design side, everything. Every every employee has an important role to play for the success of the business and everyone is appreciated for that. Um, we we like to think we have a really nice environment. We have beautiful offices um, that in Soho in Manhattan that we have spent a lot of time and, and money to create this nice environment for people to come to work every day. We are in the design industry and we felt that was very important to have a well-designed office space as well. Um, even though it's the back end and you know our clients don't see it, but we, we come here every day and we feel good. Mm. Um, and I think everyone has a large work area. You know, we dedicate a lot of square footage to everybody so that people aren't feeling crammed in and, and claustrophobic. So I think that helps a lot with productivity. We don't have cubicles. Everything is open space so people can, you know, talk across the room to each other if they need to ask someone a question. It's it's all very open and familial, um, which I think really creates a a, a great energy and a great vibe for everyone. We have very low turnover. I mean, Rachel and I having been here for 20 years is kind of not that big of a deal. We have <laughs> other people who are long, longer term, I'd say 10 to 15 years is kind of our average tenure. Um, and we celebrate that. We instituted a policy a few years ago where every five years of service, uh, every employee gets additional vacation time during that year, just as a an acknowledgement and appreciation of, of longevity. And the longer you have people working with you, the more the synergy is just there to have a better flow day to day and have better, you know, just better productivity and, and efficiency. So we really appreciate our, our Pollock family here. First of all, I always recognize to me when a company, when you look at their employee roster, whether it's five employees or 30 employees, when there is longevity in their uh, years of service that, with a particular company, that always says volumes, right? Because I agree. That's, uh, that's just awesome. Uh, what I love is that, you know, you, you just said one thing that just got my brain going there. You said that you honor each employee at at the five-year increments with extra vacation time for that year. See, that little thinking right there, that little out-of-the-box thinking is the kind of thing that I love uh, because having – you know, have, being an owner of a business, and we've got 10 or 11 employees at this point, um, mm -hmm. that's not a big company. That's not a huge company where we're going to like, yeah, everybody gets four weeks vacation. You know, you hear right. 10 years and you get four weeks. It's like, my God, my entire staff would be, you know, right. because I'm also with, you know, extreme longevity in my staff. The least uh, uh, length of person is four four years, but he's only 25 years old. So, right. you know, he hasn't had a chance to be here longer yet. Right. And, and then I've got a, a, one installer who's with me going on 25 years, who's not a partner, by the way. You know what I mean? Wow. And so, so the thing is that I, you know, as a, as the business owner, and so this is what I'm thinking, relating it to the, our, our peers listening is that's an out of the box thought that I love. I could give any individual employee at their five year, their 10 year, their 15 year extra vacation that year. But the, the thought of giving it every year has, is one of the things that stops your brain from thinking creatively. And you're just like, seriously, everybody can have three or four weeks. So, so right. creative. Do you have other little things like that, that you guys do to show value? I love the idea of creating a, a an environment because of course you are in a creative field. And so Creative people love to come in and feel like they're in a beautiful space. I know every time we do a renovation at Window Works, Kimberly's like, can I design this? Can I do that? I'm like, yes, yes, you can do okay. it all. You can make it all the way you want. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, yes, go. And um, so, so the thing is, do you have other ideas and other things that you can think of? Like if I put you on the spot and rack your brain, how you yeah, show? No, we, oh, good, good, we good. do. We, there's another one um, I can share with you. A few years ago, we started something that we call First Fridays. And um, every department, whether you're the marketing department or um, the design studio or customer service, everyone is assigned a month out of the year. And on that first Friday of the month, they have a budget to do something. And it can be anything from, you know, simply bringing in donuts or, I mean, we've had, we've had someone bring in massage chairs and everyone got a 15 minute back massage. Um, <laughs> we've had people, you know, we'll have a happy hour. We'll start, we'll kind of shut 
close down at 4.30 and start, you know, have some beers and chips and salsa. We've, you know, it's, we, we kind of challenge each department to get creative and do something that will then bring the whole company together to just share some time that's not just about work. So let me understand something. The first Friday is for the entire company, but each department has a month where they're tasked with being basically the quote unquote host or organizer of it. Exactly. Oh, exactly. That's so cool. That is. So I love, see, you know, you, you just spoke to my competitive vein there, right there. <laughs> so, and, and the fun vein, like, okay, we get to have fun and it's like kind of a contest who can have the most right. fun. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, this is Rachel. I just want to add one, one thing about that month um, when they have the first Friday, that department also um, gets their hands dirty with taking the trash out and making sure there's milk and emptying the dishwasher. So each department has a month and it doesn't matter what level you're at in the company. So I think that that's one thing that um, I've noticed Susan really does in the company is she's not afraid to get her hands dirty. She'll sew samples if needed to get it out the door quickly. (laughs) So you have a better understanding of what everyone else's job is. So there's kind of, um, you know, everyone has their different title, but uh, when we come together, um, you know, it's it's really fun. I think there's like um, a lot of friendships in this company and we, this past uh, holiday season, rather than going out to a restaurant and sending, spending tons and tons of money with everybody in their plus one, we decided to throw um, an ugly sweater contest at, <laughs> at the office, and it was a huge potluck, and we had music and dancing, and it was everyone, the shipping department, sampling department, uh, president, you know, ripping up the dance floor, so you People can never believe when they come to our parties that everyone's just like coming together. Um, and I think that that also comes from um, from the top that there's a you feel respected as an employee, and there's also very clear communication about what is expected, clear communication about what the benefits are, and um, you know that that's a really nice space to be in. I've talked to other people that don't have that and I realize how important it is to really know what's expected, what what you need to give, what you need to get and all of that. And to be supported as an employee, you know, we've had some employees who have gone through some personal issues that you know, if if they have to be out for a certain amount of time because they're dealing with something we're going to do the best we can to support that and to make sure that that we can have them come back and and be better or have their their situation resolved and and know that they still have the security of their job that's nice how how many people are in the company we have 70 employees now that's pretty remarkable that you keep because that's not again it's not a 500 person company but 70 Mm -hmm. people to have things like this happen is pretty you know, it's very, I like to call it, it's very like Google-ish or a- Apple-esque. You know what I mean? Like you just feel like, you know, everybody at Apple has got like a sleep pod and you know, right. yoga in the middle of the day. It's like, I want to work there. Right, right. <laughs> you know, I love well, these we don't ideas. Have, we don't have a ping pong table, but we, uh, <laughs> we have a yeah. nice environment. Sure. That's it. That's it. And, you know, you said something in there that's very important too. And it's something that I have said very, 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 very many times at our meetings at Window Works is that it is important that each person understand as much as it's possible. It's never entirely possible, but to understand what their coworkers job is like you know for instance in window works you know we have salespeople that you know and salespeople and designers that design and sell window treatments we have installers and then we have office admins right Mm -hmm. and you know until an installer is tasked with answering the phone for even an hour they re- it's sort of like us with what goes into a fabric. You're like, yeah, no, no, yeah, that's it. And you guys are, are you kidding me? It took us a year and a half to bring this fabric to you, and you just looked at it for a minute, right? And an mm-hmm. installer will very easily, if until he spends some time at the phone, will very easily have no problem. You can call him up. Through an hour after he was supposed to be at his next appointment, him be, oh yeah, well I'm I'm in traffic, 
And you're just like, dude, (laughs) like, you know, don't understand, you know, traffic's okay, but we have to call people and tell them we're in traffic, like, you know, or, oh, well, I'm still on the first project because, you know, the workroom didn't send any of the brackets and I had to go to Home Depot. And I had that last week. I had that last week, an installer was on a project in Hoboken, which is impossible to get to. It's, you know, 11 (laughs) miles away and takes you nine hours to get there. And he gets there and it was a big job for a designer who means a lot to us. We value their their work, all the, the, what they do. And it was an important project for the designer. And he gets there and I don't know if it was, the brackets were all wrong for this big motorized job. And you know what he did? He left the job. He drove to the workroom. Thankfully, that one was fairly local, but 45 minutes each each way and then drives back and finishes the job right mm-hmm. so that's awesome but that's that this didn't happen that day but it would not be unheard of that that same installer would be doing all that and like completely forget the next appointment and you know and you call him and you're like oh well and you're like okay on one hand really great on the right. other hand just communicate right but you stick that installer answering the telephone for two hours whole different story because it's so true yep now he hears that customer calling up and saying where's my installer where's my salesperson (laughs) we did something a few years ago where um we had our sales reps come in for a sales meeting and part of the meeting was that we took them over to the warehouse that we have in jersey city where all of our inventory is um stored and we gave everybody uh 10 pieces of paper that were CFA letters that needed to have a cut of fabric put on it and Mm. sent out as a CFA to the designer. They, you know, had to run around looking for the bolt of fabric and cutting it off and putting it in an envelope, stuffing it, putting it through the mail machine and getting it out. And it takes a lot of time. And I think just them doing that, it gave them an understanding of what our warehouse crew goes through, you know, daily just to get a CFA sent out in the mail. Right. Um, We also had people, we do a physical inventory where we have to look at every roll of fabric and compare the, you know, the yardage that's on the fabric with what we have in the computer. We, we pair up into teams and every employee, whether you're a designer or a president or a, you know, a salesperson, you're over there with a teammate and you're taking inventory and spending half a day, basically just check, checking off a list to make sure that our inventory is, is, is all right. That's so valuable, really, to, to, you know, to just put other people in each other's shoes. I, I really do, really do. Uh, I think it's a remarkable that a company your size does that on a, on a yeah. regular basis because it does. I, I, I mean, it, what's so funny is we have this, I, this situation. We sit at our meetings every Monday morning, and an installer will be like, you didn't put this on the paperwork, and you didn't this. And when salesmen will be like, you didn't this, you didn't this. And I'm like, guys. <laughs> <laughs> we're all on the same team. Yeah, here. and it's not, I mean, we're such a cl- close small group that it's not animosity but it's more just like you know and you never do this I'm like you know and I'm probably never going to <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I, I'm a tough learner here you know but yeah. uh, it's it, it is it is important to understand and even just we can't always we can't take an admin and put her on a ladder and install a window treatment but even just the actual meeting with the different types of uh, employees is valuable because they do see right. how what they do or don't do affects the other team member. Exactly. And she may not be on a ladder, but she's watching what's happening and understanding, you know, what goes into it. Exactly. Yes, exactly. So that's awesome. So I love this, you know, little bit of extra vacation time for the anniversary year, the significant milestone years. Then you have your first Fridays. And so the, the, the department is not only getting the chance to have this fun event, but that department that month is in charge of it's almost like you when you were a kid and you had your your chores on Saturday. It makes you just right. have better character, right? <laughs> right? We have you know we have a cleaning crew that comes in that we hire and they come in twice a week. But there's three other days of the week that the trash has to get taken out. Right. So someone's got to do it, and we just instituted this kind of this is this is how it's going to be, and and everyone pitches in. And what it really boils down to is about six days a year that you have a responsibility. It's right. <laughs> it's very minor. <laughs> It's no, it's funny. awesome. I love it. And then um, then your holiday party is a nice team building environment as opposed to, like you said, sitting at a dinner, which is nice, too. I mean, that's mm-hmm. nice, too, sure. not to discount it. But I guess anything becomes 
It's so funny. There's this thing. I, I don't know what. I guess they, it's the shiny syndrome, shiny object syndrome or whatever. When you, when you hardly get to do something, it seems very special and you look forward to it. But when it's something that you do every year, it becomes less valued and less appreciated. But, you know, as a company, you're still spending 10, you know, probably 10 grand on a dinner to take everybody out. Right. Exactly. And it's sort of like, and you didn't think that was good. It's like, okay. <laughs> well, so you always have to be thinking like, where are you going to get the best impact for, for, what you're spending, whether it be a, a holiday party or putting a fabric into the collection, what's where are you going to get the best return on it, whether it's from employee, you know, contentedness mm. or a sale. Right, 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 right. Well, and that's interesting because that's your role as the president that you are. It, it's funny to think about you thinking about, OK, holiday party or fabric introduction. <laughs> 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 well, I will say that, you know, my, before I moved to New York, I, I managed a little mom and pop retail store in Phoenix, Arizona, that was kind of like a small scale crate and barrel style place. And the one thing I learned from the manager that I had at that job was um, don't ever do anything. Don't ever ask anybody to do something that you haven't done yourself so that you really understand mm. what's involved in it, how long it's going to take. I mean, if you don't know how long something's going to take to finish, how can you plan other projects beyond that and hit deadlines. Mm. You, you can't. You really need to have a, a very strong understanding of what goes into each task. So I'm not saying I know how to design a fabric, right. but I work closely with the studio to understand what what that timeline is and what's reasonable in terms of our introductions and how far in advance we need to just order the fabric so that we can get it sampled and through the whole distribution system. Right, right, and right. And it's a long time. <laughs> yes. Well, well, I think that's very, you know, it's, uh, look, 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 you're clearly a brilliant businesswoman here. I mean, there's no question about it. It's coming through loud and clear, but that's awesome to, you know, you. to, like you said, you're not going to sit there and design the fabric, but you're also not sitting in an office somewhere and saying, okay, Rach, you know, get going on another fabric. And then every six months going, hello, what's happening? Like, you know, right. the process that Rachel and her team are going through so that your expectations are aligned with the, the realities. And maybe there might be times that you have to put your business hat on and say, you know, a little faster, sweetie, or a little less <laughs> of that. But you're, you, you have taken the time to really understand what each of the little cogs in the system are. I had that, I remember I had that learning experience with Billy, my partner, he's our lead installer. And we, my husband and I, you know, we're type A. Okay. We're like, get it done. Let's go. Rah, rah, rah. Like, just right. And especially when we were younger, I mean, you know what I mean? And he would say, it's going to take me eight hours to do this installation. And we'd be like, what? You're out of your mind. You, what are you, are you going to lunch? Like, what are you doing? Are you eating during the day? Like, just get it done. And, right. and we would consistently, my husband particularly would consistently, if Billy said eight hours, my husband would put him in for six. Like, just did it all the time. And, and Billy constantly ran late. And the thing is, Billy is very even keel. And this is the exact personality you want as the last person to touch your client in this process. Because on the install, it's very intense. It can Things can go wrong. And he is this guy. He's like, yeah, we're going to work it out. It's going to be fine. Let me just make this adjustment, right? So, but the point is that we literally for years would butt heads. And literally for years, he would run late. And we'd be like, you didn't call. And he'd be like, you're not giving him enough time time and blah 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 and then one time I was on an install with him and the first thing he was going to do is put up the drapery rods in the family room and I said okay I have to go out and get shopping for this accessories la 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 I'll be back I came back three hours later he was literally putting in the the wall the first bracket and I looked at him I was like what have you been doing all day? And it was a line of rods that we had never used before. It was double traversing. It was very complicated. It was like a European line. The directions weren't in English. And he's a seasoned 20 year installer at that point. And he just turned around and looked at me and he said, do I ask you how long it takes you to do what you do? Get out of here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember <laughs> calling my husband going, you know, he's not full of crap. It actually takes a long time to do this stuff. <laughs> wow. But, you know, these are the things that you learn, you know. And so I share these things because there is a principle out there that probably this week had a junior or an intern 
do a task for them that they thought was completely unreasonably, you know, too long to accomplish it. But if you've never done the task yourself or it's one right. of the first times you've done it. And so I think that's awesome that as a, a larger company like yours, that you still maintain those values of being able to be in touch with employees at every level. It's an important lesson for us because if you can do it with 70 employees, I think we could do it with our five or six or 10. <laughs> right, right. You know, how much easier, right? With just five or six or 10 or one, right? One. So it's awesome. And the thing is what it, it goes to show too is, you know, Rachel, you alluded to that this industry is not the banking industry. It doesn't have the kind of salaries that the finance industry has. I've got uh, daughters that are one in finance and one not. And the contrast is ridiculous. They're both brilliant. They're both smart. They both work their fannies off. <laughs> it's like that. Mm -hmm. The contrast is insanity, right? In the remuneration, the financial remuneration. Right. Um, but the thing is that it, you're, the way you run your company proves the point that it isn't always the dollars that create that loyalty and that longevity and that um, camaraderie within a team and a company. And that's something that each of us, whether we have one person working for us or five or 10, can, can really take a lesson from. So I, I value sharing that with us. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. So cool. Well, we, we spend so much time at our jobs. Mm -hmm. We spend the majority of our waking hours here. So if you don't like what you're doing or you don't like the people you're working with it seems like a real waste of life mm -hmm. you know <laughs> I mean no you're one right. wants to do you're that exactly no one right. wants to be working in a bad work environment you know that's just like a bummer in general for your life so it's really nice to um, work at a place where you feel valued and um, you know comfortable and get along with the people and then Cre creating beautiful things. I mean, that's why we're all doing this because right. we, we like the product and we like this industry, but it sure is the um, cherry on top to like your job as well. Right. Exactly. So before I let you ladies go, tell us uh, how many Pollock or do you have a showroom in every design center? Tell us a little bit about for the designers who are listening that maybe they've never heard of Pollock. I don't know that that could be true, but it could be true, <laughs> you know, be. right? And so where are your locations and how do they access you and all of that? We have um, our product in showrooms in most of the major territories. Um, so in Los Angeles, San Francisco, um, Dania in the design center there. Uh, we have, of course, New York at the D&D building. And we have recently started changing our distribution in some other key uh, territories, such as Atlanta, Chicago, uh, Boston, Dallas, and Houston, where we have employee sales reps who are focused only on selling our brands uh, in those territories. So they will be calling on the residential and commercial clients in those territories, either visiting you at your office or meeting you at a, another location that's convenient. But we don't have showroom presence, but you can find all of those those resources, whether it's an employee rep or a showroom on our website. We also are represented in Asia and in the UK and in France. So we have worldwide distribution. Um, and all of that, again, is available on our website to get the specifics. Okay. So I love it. That's awesome. So for instance, if there's, there's not a physical showroom presence, there's very likely a rep that will service the area and bring the collection to you to see some of the collections. And of Absolutely. course, and what I love too, is that, um, you know, so, particularly a rep like Ruthie, who we mentioned earlier is very knowledgeable, very passionate and, and has a great expertise in this, that rep can be a valuable resource, whether there's a showroom presence or not. Because I know there's times when you can just say to Ruthie, hey, I'm looking for this or I, I, we wanted to use this, but it's not appropriate for right. the, the, the application that I need to use it for. Is there something? And she will, you know, get on it for you and mm -hmm. help you find something. So that's very important, the support there. So that's awesome. Right. I mean, we just noticed, and I think it's a typical conversation in, in our industry right now, is that it is changing and the way people shop is changing and maybe showrooms aren't in certain situations aren't necessarily the the right 
thing for the brand, depending mm-hmm. on the brand and depending on the focus. So mm-hmm. we, it was a little bit of an experiment for us and, and it's proven to be very successful in these certain territories. I don't think we would ever not have a showroom in New York or right. Los Angeles, you know, that, that you really need that. And um, we just felt that we could focus the effort on the, the direct sales in certain areas and it's and it's proven to work out well for our brands nice nice well you know what i noticed with kim kim is a designer that works for me and she is much more likely to go online to source fabrics for her drapery projects than i am right. i i just I, my brain for, i'm like no no, I will stand <laughs> in my showroom for, thankfully I have like 2,000 books in my showroom. I will stand in my showroom for two hours pulling and opening books individually before I do it online. Unless I'm looking for a blue fabric with an elephant on it. Then, okay, <laughs> right. then I'll search it. You know what I mean? Right. But if I'm just like, hey, textures, yeah, right. Okay, 5,000 things come up. I'm sorry, my mm-hmm. brain just froze over. <laughs> okay. But she's very effective at it. She's skilled at it. And um, it's, the, it's, it's, it, it's probably generational. You know what I'm saying? It, it, I, I think it's probably personality as well, but it's also mm-hmm. generational. And so you could see how going into the future, you could be successful in markets that you don't have a presence because the younger generation is willing to do things online that, you know, old people like me are not. <laughs> right. I think as long as you have the, the back end support to, you know, get the sample out next day or second mm-hmm. day, which we do all the time, um, do those functions that the showrooms provide um, you have to replicate it and you have to do it really well or else it's not going to work. Right, 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 right. So she, you were saying that if a designer is in an area without a showroom, they can look online and then contact their rep and they're going to get the sample, the memo sample right away as opposed to this whole delay in the process. Understood. Exactly. Okay, awesome. Very, very cool. I think it's awesome. I, You know, I'm not surprised that Lori spoke highly of you guys and I'm not surprised that you guys are a good fit together because you're both, I'm going to say this is going to sound very Oprah Super Soul Sunday-ish, but you just <laughs> feel like, you know, you both feel like your heart forward first soul fo- forward first people like that the culture seems a very good match it's it's pretty cool I can't agree with you more, but thank you for saying that. <laughs> well, guys, thank you tons. Uh, hopefully you'll get a lot of new interior designers reaching out to you to learn more about the fabrics and the textiles that you have available and the wallpaper collection that Lori's got and all the good goodies that you've got in your showrooms there for us to you know work with and specify on our projects. Thanks, Luann. It's been great talking to you. It's been really fun. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Have you listened to the show with Lori Weitzner yet, number 308? If you're in the design industry and somehow you don't know who Lori is, she is a textile, wallpaper, and trim designer who is hugely successful. And she took her passion for textile design, created a brand, and then she partnered with Pollock. So together, they can do even better things in the textile arena. I'm promising you, if you have not listened to this show yet, you must because it's it's just one of those shows. Lori is a very special lady and she shared some really wonderful insights to the industry and her journey. So that's episode 308. And I have to say the conversations that we get to have here on the show with all the icons in our industry are always nice and always fun to listen to, but maybe not always. Maybe you don't like them as much for the reasons that I like them for. I like them because every single one of these shows, whether it was the one with Candace Olsen in number 74 or Amber Lewis, number 184, or both of Shay McGee's shows, 236 and 270, or Corey Damon Jenkins show, 127, we have in each of these always heard the moment when it was decision time for these highly successful people. There are moments when they had to decide to believe in themselves, to take the risk and put it all on the line. There's no phoning it in with the success that comes with what these individuals have created. And today we learn pretty much the same thing about Pollock from Susan and Rachel. These women are leaders in this company and they make intentional choices and policies that create a company culture of excellence. This does not happen to a company. 
Okay. You don't wake up one day and say, oh, yay, I have it all going on here. No. If you want to inspire your employees to be their best, to make your clients take notice of you. And if you want to be a business that you are proud of, you must do the same thing. You must decide and you must lead and you must take responsibility for it. It starts with you, just like it has with each of these people that I mentioned, and also with Susan and Rachel, who literally, thoughtfully lead Pollock. All right? I hope this show um, caused a little spark of inspiration for you, something that you can do in your firm to make it better and to make it the kind of place that people want to be engaged with. All right. Now follow me on Instagram at Luann Nigara and on Facebook at a well-designed business. If you want the email each week about who's going to be on the show, about what events I'm either hosting or what I will be speaking at, you can get on the list easily by texting the number four, 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 nine, nine, nine. Just take your phone out and text the number four, 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 nine, nine, nine. Enter the word design biz, D E S I G N B I Z. No caps, no spaces. Okay. One last thing. Um, a lot of you have recently, it's just a weird thing. All of a sudden in the last week or two, I've gotten a few messages from um, several of you that have tried to leave a review on iTunes and you couldn't because it's such a pain. <laughs> I know it's a hassle. I have no idea why it's a hassle for some and not for others, but I do know that mostly it's a hassle. So I'd like to thank you if you have plowed through their little process there and left a review for the show. I really do truly read every single one of them. I appreciate every single one of them. And I actually direct our sponsors and potential sponsors to them to show the strength of our little tribe here. So before I go, I want to say a big thanks to the most recent reviewers, Lori Carpenter. Hi, Lori. How are you, sweetie? Surround Designs, CMN Designs, Kylie Dean Designs, and Jillian Scott. So I know it's a real hassle to do, but I do value and I do appreciate it. And it does help me continue to bring the show to you. All righty. Think about it. Make your decision. Go out today and decide to be excellent. Thank you so much for joining me again today. This podcast is a production of Window Works, your resource for custom window treatments and awnings. To learn how we can help you on your next interior design project, go to www.windowworks-nj.com. And if you're interested in working with me on your business, either through masterminds or one-on-one coaching, or you want to know how to get my book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, or you just want to know what's going on in the podcast land, and where I'm going to be. All of that is found at luannnigara.com. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day.